Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special broadcast of Grit and Glamour. I'm your host, Ruby Veridiano, and on today's show, we're going to be talking about how to deal with election anxiety. As the U.S. elections inch around the corner from us, I know many of us are feeling really anxious about potential outcomes because we don't know what that's going to mean for America, much less for the rest of the world. And that's why I'm really excited to bring on to the show today my lovely and brilliant guest, Carrie Twig, who worked alongside Vice President Joe Biden as a Director of Public Affairs during the Obama administration. And she's going to be talking to us about how to manage this election anxiety, uh, about her personal experience working at the White House and with Joe Biden, and how to stand in hope regardless of what happens. Carrie is a political strategist and media personality, and she's also a founding partner at Culture House, a woman of color owned documentary production company. And finally, since this is a show for fashion change makers, we're of course going to be covering the politics of dress as well. So without further ado, let's bring on Carrie Twig onto the show. Hi, good morning, Ruby. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Carrie? Good, good. What's the weather like where you're tuning in from? It is gray and dreary autumn day. I'm in Ohio. I'm at my parents' house and um, yeah. Trees are but beautiful, I, but the sky is is hiding from us today. Right. Yes, but I, I'm thrilled to learn that you are actually um, based across the Atlantic now. So that is an interesting, um, interesting new thing. But yeah, one of 2020's great surprises is now I basically live in London. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, good. We're neighbors, so I'm excited to welcome you onto the show. And as you know, the elections are around the corner, and with the recent kind of appointment to the Supreme Court justice, we everybody's feeling a little bit like what's going to happen, what's going on. Uh, you worked in the thick of things, the thick of politics. So you have an insider's perspective of what uh, what's happening. So from your perspective, what are your thoughts on potential outcomes and what that could mean for a country? Yeah, you know, it, it's so tough. I mean, the 2016 election, um, I think, really eviscerated anyone's sense of intuition about these things. And so very few of us sort of trust ourselves or trust polls and therefore know what indicators to even look at. That said, um, at the very least, Americans are deeply engaged in paying attention. In a lot of states, we're even looking at numbers of people who have early voted that exceed the total number of people that voted in all of, of 2016 for the entirety of the election. We still have almost a week to go. So that's really exciting. No matter what, Americans are paying more attention, they're being more engaged, they're taking the process more seriously. And that's a good thing. Um, I tend to believe that when you see high levels of turnout, that favors um, pr more progressive uh, can candidates and campaigns. We're seeing that bear borne out a little bit in some of the modeling. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a race to the finish. There's a lot there. You know, a friend of mine on the Upper West Side of New York yesterday told me that the line was six hours long. And so a lot has been done to starve our election infrastructure, as well as our mail, um, our American Postal Service infrastructure, where a lot of people are voting by mail. And so it is there are causes for concern um, that the vote is not as freely open and accessible as it should be. Um, and, you know, but that said, at least at the very least, countries are always better when the people are engaged. And that's where we are at the moment. Yeah, I mean, voting from abroad, I actually had to harass my local pol uh, like office. And I was like, look, did I get my ballot? Can I fax it in? If I can fax it in, can you go ahead and check if the fax came through? Because I think that this has been like an election where I feel like I can't sleep on this. Exactly. Uh, and I think a lot of people do feel that way. Um, but now there are a lot of people who still feel uninspired by uh, Joe Biden as their candidate. Um, you worked uh, personally with him and alongside him. So what are what's something that you can tell us, maybe like a specific memory or an incident that kind of uh, helps to us to understand the true character of our of our, of the, of our pre Democratic presidential candidate? Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden's a great guy. He's funny. Yeah. He's so much smarter than he gets credit for because I think he cares <laughs> more that people are happy and feel good. But you're in these closed door meetings with him and he's razor sharp. Um, 
That said, one of my favorite, you know, favorite stories about him is Joe Biden has suffered a lot of personal tragedy. He's lost two of his children. His first wife died in a horrific car accident, right? On his on her way to take their children um, for to buy a Christmas tree. And she died along with their toddler aged daughter. Um, and his two boys were in the hospital. And then one of those sons subsequently later passed away from cancer. And so this is a guy who knows what trauma is and knows what it is to grieve and to lose the most precious things you possibly have. And, um, you know, we were on Air Force Two one day and one of my colleagues was FaceTiming his daughter and the vice president walks by, there's like a staff cabin and he has his own sort of executive office on the plane and he walks through and my colleague is FaceTiming with his daughter and he's like, sir, do you want to say happy birthday? It's my daughter's sixth birthday and she's having her party today. And uh, the vice president just looked at him and was like, okay, and said, stopped and said happy birthday to his daughter, the little girl. And then he was like, hey, when, um, let me know when you're off the phone. And uh, he was like, okay, no problem. I won't say his name, but my colleague gets off the phone and <laughs> the vice president circles us all around and he goes, let me make something perfectly clear to all of you. Under no circumstances should you miss the child's birthday to spend a day working with me. That is unacceptable. And if I ever find out that any of you are missing important family days to work for me, you will be fired. <laughs> and then the next morning, so this was on a Saturday, and then on Monday morning, we all had a personally signed letter from the president, everyone on the vice president's staff, personally signed letter from the vice president saying, under no circumstances, are you supposed to miss a meeting with or a an, an event with a family member a neighbor a friend um, a lover a boyfriend a girlfriend in order to work for him he's been doing this longer than half of us have been alive he does not need you to come with him for one trip on one day he will survive without all of us right and that's the kind of person he was when he would call you late at night or early in the morning or on the weekend he'd start with an apology he'd be like i'm so so sorry to take you away from your family um can i ask you a quick question He's a humble person who understands what matters, who takes people's lives very, very seriously. Um, this was on this trip that this happened, actually. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like he is, that's who he is. He cares about family. He cares about what genu genuinely matters to people. I was one of the first staffer, I think I was the staffer to first brief him on the Black Lives Matter movement. And he's reading the Black Lives Matter manifesto. And this is a 70 year old white guy, you know? And he's just like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All of this makes perfect sense. This was in 2014, by the way. This was yeah. before Black Lives Matter was a pop culture tour de force, right? And he was just like, all of this is so reasonable. Why is this controversial at all? Um, that's who he is. He has a reflexive humanity and a reflexive sense of fairness. So that's the Joe Biden I know. I would also help people to understand three important factors why I think it's really important that Joe Biden be president. One is Donald Trump has starved the administrative state. The, the US government is the largest employer in the world, right? We do everything, whether it's preserving global languages from all over the world, to fighting climate change, to um, to running healthcare, all of these things, right? And, and Donald Trump doesn't believe in government. And so the government is a bit in the shambles. Joe Biden is the only person alive that's eligible to be president who has the ability to be president on day one, right? He has the shallowest learning curve of anyone who could potentially be president. So he can make it happen right away. Second, he has international relationships. He knows every major head of state and he's known them for years, sometimes when they were from the time they were in smaller, uh, lesser offices. And so he can start repairing the relationships that we have damaged over the course of the last few years and not have to go through this period of like, who is this guy and can we trust him? He's a known entity around the world. And then third, Anyone who's been in America, who's been watching America, knows that we are dealing with some very serious domestic issues, right? We have rampant white supremacists that are out of control and starting militia. We are dealing with racism, systemic sexism, xenophobia, homophobia. I mean, we're just having a really hard time. <laughs> and 
there are so many good people in America and there's so many people who are just don't know what to do. And so they're just being caught up in all of it. And um, Joe Biden, as a straight white man, can get up and say, like, guys, cut it out. Stop it. This is not who we are. He can be a president from that from that circle, can model what it looks like to be a straight white man that is an older guy and say, I've absolutely this is this is silly. Of course, Black Lives Matter. Of course, marriage uh, is for everyone. I um, mean, he's played that role in the administration before. And so we know that he'll do it again. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, for contextualizing that and also sharing those personal anecdotes that we don't get to hear on the news. We hear, for those of us who are still watching the news, I mean, a lot of it is just, you know, we don't know what to pay attention to. We don't know what's real. And in between all of the facts and all the bad news, it's hard to cut through uh, the things that matter. So thank you for contextualizing not only the personal kind of character uh, of Joe Biden, but also the qualifications that I think people miss out on because they're so caught up in all of the other um, kind of uh, politics of it all, really, yeah. right? So if Joe Biden is elected, what issues do you see him tackling first? I mean, everyone has to go straight to the coronavirus, right? He's going, I mean, that's, that's just a given. Um, so he's going to be dealing with the coronavirus and the economy, um, trying to figure out how we can maintain an economy, get as few money, many people out of a recession as possible, what support for individual families and businesses looks like. Um, and I think a little bit further afield is figuring out what our national health care policy is, right? Uh, Obamacare has been starved. It had some problems anyway. And so what does the next iteration of that look like? It's driven home, the coronavirus has driven home what a crucial human right access to affordable healthcare is. We have people walking out of hospitals in this country with 25 and $30,000 in medical bills because they got coronavirus. Um, that is unconscionable and that's unacceptable. And so what are we going to do to address that? A little bit further afield, I think we're gonna see a major push for infrastructure, um, building, that was me voting the other day. Uh, <laughs> Voting, excuse me, uh, you know, repairing bridges, building access to high speed rail, um, um, you know, re reconfiguring airports and ports and other elements of major infrastructure that the country really needs in order to join the 21st century. A lot of our um, current infrastructure is, is from post World War II era, and it's just it's just not sufficient. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people who watch the show are interested in sustainability. Um, so where do you see the Green New Deal fitting into his agenda? I think it's going to be really high. I mean, you you talk to some client scientists and they are um, they've been really surprised by how he has taken on sort of the most aggressive, progressive um, elements of environmental policy across the board and really embraced those. Without a doubt, climate change is the existential crisis figuring out uh, facing all humans everywhere. And so we need to be really um, laser focused on that. And I think a couple things are really important here. One is it is an international effort. It does not matter if we do it alone. We have to do it as a global community. And Joe Biden is again, positioned to have those international relationships with trust um, and with leadership and be willing to do that. Also, 60% of the people who live on coastal uh, lands around the world are people of color. And so having, a having an American president that has a framework and has a lens to understand that there are issues that impact people of color more dramatically than others and is willing to say that and willing to value that and make that part of his policy is going to be something we have not had for four years. And that is going to be really important to how that plan um, gets enacted. And yeah, so, you know, without a doubt that is it, it is a it is a humanitarian issue it is a national security issue um it is it could not be more important and what we've seen so far out of his policy shop has been you know sort of the gold standard of of sustainability policy 
Thank you. Yeah. And for all of those, after all of that, right? Like after all of that you've given us, if there are still people out there who are like, well, I'm jaded and I don't think my vote, uh, I don't think America deserves my vote. So for the people who are still like, I don't want to vote, what would you say to them? You know what? It's if you honestly think that the that the decisions that govern government's going to make decisions with or without you. Yeah. Period. So you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. But the idea that you that you are not contributing to what like government's like it's voting is like ordering off of a menu. So you're actually saying what you want. And the idea, you know, I hear so often from folks that it's just like, no, 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 I'm just going to worry about me. And it's just civic health is as important to your individual emotional health, your psychological health and your your physiological health. Right. You try maintaining mental health if you're in a if you're in the middle of a civil war. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so this year, I think, has connected the dots for people that civic health is as important to everything else. We want to meditate. We want to eat organic. We're going to yoga. We're putting lemons in our water and then not voting. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And guess what? Like, no one cares if you, the sad thing is no one cares if you stay silent. Yeah. If you don't vote, if you stay silent, no one's going to miss you because they don't know that they, they don't have a voice in their head to be like, wait a second, we're missing somebody. Yeah. And the, you know, so I get a little stuck here because I, it, it's just the, the logic doesn't hold up. Yeah. Um, they will move without you and, and it would be better with your voice, with your contribution. When I was, um, when I was 11 or 12, I asked my mom what government was. And she told me it's old white men sitting in a room deciding how free you are. And that is still the most succinct and accurate definition of government and power that I have ever heard. And the only way you can ensure that the people in those rooms making decisions about your life think about you is if you speak up. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that framework of civic engagement and civic health being so much a part of our individual health. And I think it was Liza Koshy who actually said, voting is an act of self-love. And I was like, you're right. You know what? Like if I love my life, if I love myself, I need to actually use my voice to vote in and advocate for what's gonna make me healthy and what's gonna make my life better. So Absolutely. I love that framework and thank you. Um, as you know, the, the theme of the show is how uh, uh, trying to give advice to people who are feeling anxious about the election. So for those who are dealing with election anxiety right now, what would be your kind of words of wisdom for them? It's a great question. I'm right there with you on my <laughs> we're, on, we're, all in it. <laughs> we're all in it together. My nails have, are in a stressful state. Um, <laughs> The, you know, listen, the things that I do for myself, some some days I do not follow the news. I maybe do like one check-in and then leave it alone. You know, I don't need to follow every minute and every making and breaking. And we oh, we underestimate, I think, how exposed we are to the news. Um, and so really like I'll take the news notifications off on my phone. I won't check Twitter. I um, won't have a TV on. Like I will actually do hard, hard abstinence on the news because it puts me in, a, in an anxiety cycle. And the first debate, I did not watch. I had friends text me, what, like, buffer, what is going, what is happening? Because I can't actually, it's going to set me off. Um, and so, you know, build in safety barriers for yourself and don't feel like you're a bad person if you're not following every minute of every news cycle, because it's, go it's gonna make us all a uh, little shabbier, a little worse for the wear. And so give yourself permission to take a couple days off and just to stay away. And trust me, if there is something that is that you have to know about, you'll be told about it. <laughs> you will find out somehow. Um, but I think really giving ourselves permission to step away is one thing that's really important. I think the other thing that's really important is volunteer, do something proactive. It's often really hard to deal and, and have these feelings and then feel like, well, 
it's just all happening to me as opposed to I'm engaged in the process. And so you can do text messages to voters from home. You can do calls. There's all sorts of websites you can go to to volunteer, whether it's for down ballot candidates or for um, presidential candidates. You can go from a, you can donate money. You can uh, do it from abroad. You can do it anywhere in the world. So there are things that so you can either just sort of be mindful of what you are taking in media is not neutral and so it will not always have a neutral feeling within you when you when you read it so you can give yourself a break there and you can then dive in and be part of the action part of the process do something proactive so that it feels like you're in it and you're helping to steer it versus it just happening to you yeah that's really helpful advice i know that i've started volunteering not necessarily just for the elections but just volunteering in general because at least you make it makes it it makes you feel like okay there's something good that's happening to balance out some of the other bad stuff that's happening but just being a participatory citizen um in your local community is really helpful and for me, I have a best friend who, uh, her name is Jenna B. I don't know if she's watching, but if she is, here's a shout out to her, but she loves watching the news. So for me, I just ask her what's happening because at least it's coming from a filter of someone who I love and who I adore. So it's already cushioned somewhere. So, you Great. know, do something like that. Yep. Um, now I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about uh, the politics of dress because this is a fashion show after all and I have a lot of folks who are watching who are in the intersection of fashion and change making and um, you know it was Michelle Obama that said that you know even her, the way what she wears is a political statement um, you know people think that fashion is like this, you know, thing that's just about vanity, but it's really about us uh, being able to choose how we want to be addressed through what we wear. Um, so, you know, I want to know from you and your experience working in politics and in the White House, and even now in your work in media, how does the politics of dress show up in your life? And how do you deal with it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of go back and forth. I, um, at the White House, because I did work that was really specific. When you work for an elected official, you have to see the world through their viewpoint, right? And so part of dressing became a way for me to express myself with full autonomy. And, you know, it was the Obamas. It was a stylish White House. Michelle Obama was walking around, right? So like you, we had to, you had to bring it a little bit, um, or at least you could bring it a little bit if you wanted to. And so um, also because you're, you're, it's, it's very specific work that has to pass the lawyers and the, eth in the ethics office and the communications office and the president and first lady themselves. Um, fashion became such an important moment of, of self-expression. Now that I work in a creative industry and I'm making movies and TV shows with my production company, Culture House, I've actually reverted to sort of um, all black in the winter and then all white in the summer. And I do a little bit more uniform. Of, of, I have a more of a uniform thing going, which has been really interesting. And I think part of it is because I'm expressing myself creatively in other ways. And I'm looking at mood boards and I'm writing a lot and we're shooting, we're on these sets and we're, you know, um, and so I think that has satiated the part of me that really has something to say um, that is specific and unique and that is determined by me. And so I'm perfectly fine just to be in a black top and black pants uh, all day long, day after day after day. Are you wearing Converse's and Timberland's? I do wear Converse's. I don't <laughs> wear Timberland's. I find them to be too heavy, okay. um, but I I'm a big Converse person. And there is this picture of me that I think I posted, but on my last day at the White House, I wore Converse's and that was my big. <laughs> That was my big articulation of self. Um, instead of wearing my typical sort of Manolo high heels, I was in my white, you know, cruddy converses walking around the halls of the White House. Um, and so, so yeah, you know, I, 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 for me, fashion is much more about, um, w w you know, being able to articulate something that I have to say. And I will always revert to fashion if that's my main uh, avenue. Um, and then when I have other kind of venues, I'm, I'm a little bit more kind of workman uniform, reduced decisions, yeah. 
Yeah, well, I asked about the Converse's and Timberlands because Kamala Harris has been pictured wearing this multiple times. And I'm just curious uh, if you think she's sharing any hidden messages or if that's just, you know, she's comfortable. Okay, like let's not make a big deal out of it. Or is there something else that she's trying to say with those choices? You know, I can't speak for her, but I think it's both, right? I think, I don't, I don't know that it's a hidden message <laughs> so much as it is, so much as it is a statement about the fact that she is a black woman, she's a young black woman, and will bring that generational dynamic to the White House and will bring that point of view. And that's gonna show up not only in her fashion choices, but in other parts of, of her administration and her policies. Um, you know, I think that's a generational statement. The idea, you know, there was this constant sort of push in the White House of like, can we at least not wear ties on Friday among some of the guys? Because it's this, it's this very, it's been around forever, right? It's this legendary sort of state institution. And, and that is not in keeping with young people and the vast majority of Americans uh, demographically and in raw numbers of population are under 50. And so the idea, and they're getting younger and younger, right? Gen Z is the biggest population. It will be matched by the generation, the population underneath it, the generation underneath it. And so I think it's about saying, you know, this is, this is something new. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and I'm a black woman and I will be unapologetically those things. I will be unapologetically uh, in my forties I will, or however old she is, I'm not actually sure. Um, <laughs> and we'll, and we'll bring that, that also um, yeah. in addition to the power suits, in addition to being the prosecutor, in addition to being someone who is very serious and has very serious policy chops. She also is articulating that she's a full human being. And I think that's wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Now, um, speaking of being a full human being, women who love fashion often feel like they need to tone it down if they're working in like areas such as the po politics, tech, or academia. They feel like people won't take them seriously, or people actually do have this perception that if you um, are styling yourself a little bit, that maybe you're not taking your work as seriously as you should. Uh, what would be your kind of um, advice to women who still want to live their truth, but they also want to maintain professional um, stance and decorum um, in their workplaces? Yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, um, make some of those calculations for yourself. The reality is that there are people who will judge you and diminish you and think less of you for choices that you make. Like, So then are you gonna live your life based on what those people do or do not think about you when it actually has nothing to do with what you wear? They, If the issue is, oh, but she wears this, they don't want women in their office anyway. Right. Like, right. it, it's not actually about your clothing, right? It's yeah. about the fact that they don't want women of color and they don't want, they're, they don't want women or they don't want people of color. They don't want young people. Yeah. Act, your clothes are just a convenient excuse. Um, and so, you know, I was told a lot, I was asked a lot before I started at the White House, like, well, I assume you'll straighten your hair. And I was like, to go work for black people. <laughs> Are you crazy? Right. right? But yeah. this idea of respectability, this idea that the way we are as we are is insufficient and, and, and is unprofessional um, is just so much bias that we have perpetuated. And every time we make the choice to agree to that, every time one of us straightens our hair, or every time one of us just like wears a suit, even though we don't want to, um, we help to reinforce that. And listen, I'm not trying to judge anyone for their choices. We all got to make money. We all got to make rent. We all got to have mortgages and, and people to support. And so you got to make the choices that you can. But those of us with relative power and privilege to actually open those doors open um, should do so because it's all just made up in people's heads and we can't live our lives um, based on what some person, based on the judgments of other people, you know? Um, we won't make progress that way. I'm sure there's so many people who are hearing that are probably like, yes, finally. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yes. Like I could hear a collective sound of like, mm, and not all whoever is listening to, to what you just said. So thank you for, for, for that perspective and that advice. Um, I want to shift gears one more time because as you know, the uh, show is called Grit and Glamour. So I really want to share with people some of the unglamorous things because there's a lot of young people out there right now who think that success 
success happens instantaneously because we do live in a social media world where we only see the end product. We only see the glossy pictures, but we're not seeing the behind the scenes process. So I'm curious to know, like, what are some of the internal challenges that you may have had to uh, go through and deal with in your journey and how did you overcome them? Yeah, you know, when I was re when I started my career in politics, I was really young. I was 19. I graduated college at 19 and was working for the governor of Ohio when I was 20. And I was almost always the youngest person in, the, in a room. I was often younger than interns and I had a paid full-time position. Um, and I was almost to a point the only woman of color, often the only woman. And so you know, I built up a bunch of a bunch of defense mechanisms about those things. You know, I was self-conscious about being young. I was self-conscious about being the only in a lot of contexts. Um, and then there were some safety requirements. A lot of my jobs as the years went on required me to be out late at night, required me to be in rooms of all men um, with alcohol. Like, you know, politics is a very smoky back room business. And so I would be 24 and 25 and like in these meetings with these old dudes trying to like wheel and deal. Um, and it was really intimidating. And so in order to not feel so intimidated and get my job done, I like very much armored up and and was was harsh and kind of cold and would make fun of people. But so, you know, you just couldn't be nice. Um, and so part of my struggle was and then you're working 18 hours a day. Yeah. So then you just become that person. So part of my struggle was as I get older, how do I start putting down some of that armor? Cause I actually no longer, am, I'm not 21 and I do know what I'm doing, right? And so now that I'm 34, it's like, I know what I'm doing. I have power, I have agency, I have control. I can articulate myself. I have the resume, I have the experience. And so I don't need to rely on these defense mechanisms that kept me safe in a bunch of ways, but that were expensive, right? It's heavy to carry around some of those burdens. Um, and so being, you know, a willing to do, make the choices you have to make in order to get through a situation, but being aware of the fact that they're choices, right? Mm -hmm. Like whether it's code switching or whether, you know, we, we just remember to check in and be, be really thoughtful about, um, about who you're becoming in order to accomplish what and and is it temporary or is it who you actually are so i think that was one thing was sort of like figuring out how i could be more and increasingly more and more myself um, in my work i also think being more protective of myself i am incredibly protective of other people but like wouldn't be very protective of myself and so whether that was working insane hours or saying yes when i really meant no and then you're getting, you're just like, oh, oh, you don't, I don't want to do this anymore, right? Um, being, being more willing to be uncomfortable and building up my own tolerance for for being for the discomfort that no can sometimes bring. Um, now I'm just like, girl, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but ten years ago, that was a real struggle for me, and a lot of young people and a lot of women struggle with that. And so you have to train yourself to really have boundaries. And boundaries are for you, but they're also for everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. And so th that is really important, um, I think, for folks to start understanding that's going to help you maintain some sanity and not have work that leaves you burnt out that you then spend years recovering from. Like, it's all just time and you can't get time back. And so the more you take care of yourself in the process, the better um, you'll be able to accomplish the things that you that you want and you need. And then just being super mindful about culture. We do not live in a neutral culture, right? And we do not live in a culture that was designed for anyone to thrive except for straight white men. And no disrespect to straight white men, like go get it, boo-boo. However, we all need to be really aware of the fact that we're not necessarily set up to, to succeed. And so what does that then mean for us? And how are we, when we're able, how do we set aside some of the fa fallacies that are pinned on us as women, whether it's we're not serious if we put on mascara or we're not serious if we wear bright colors or if we like to do our hair or whatever, or that there's 
an opportunity only for one of us or that we should be hyper competitive with one another or all of this stuff, right? All of this stuff is just falsehoods and false economies that are set up to keep women, people of color sidelined. And so we have to fight the tide of that everywhere we go. And, and in my business now, Culture House, we really pride ourselves on asking ourselves that question every single day. Every time we set up a team for a documentary or for a show, we're just like, okay, so what model do we want to use here? We're, we don't we don't have to use the traditional triangle hierarchy, one all powerful director, and then everyone reports to that person. We can set up an ecosystem. We can have multiple directors. We can how do how will women best thrive? How how does this story best thrive? Throw away the old ideas and mel, mel, build yourself a new one. And I think. The more we give ourselves permission to do that, the more we give ourselves permission to say, wait a second, how would I best flourish? How would this project, ooh, can I help her? Can she, I, I need her help, right? The more we're working with one another and really pushing back against these ideas that you have to be um, a specific way that is not who, how we actually are, the, the happier we'll all be, the more things will change, um, and just the more rewarding and enriching our work will be. Yes, I totally agree. I love creating spaces where everybody can flourish because there's no need to compete with each other when we can just actually create our own table, put our own food on it, and everybody eats. Everybody, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and everybody's healthy. So I love that. Um, speaking of Culture House, uh, I, I, this is my last question for you. And I know that you, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you've transitioned from the world of politics into now this creative space. Tell us more about Culture House and where we can find your work. Yeah, so it's been such an incredible journey. So, you know, it's really interesting. There's this um, habit, it's, it's starting to seem like a pattern of some Obama era folks leaving, uh, leaving politics and going into storytelling. And I think part of that is including the Obamas, the Obamas have a production company. Um, and I think part of that is two together. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and a bunch of my colleagues are now, are now kind of out in Hollywood or doing something around film, TV, podcasts, um, and I think part of it is because we're all, even though we're also people who are animated by the idea of social change, we're aware of the fact that so much of our politics is an offshoot of the story that we believe about ourselves and about our country. And so Donald Trump is a symptom, not a cause. And what is the cause is believing this story about America. And so how do we start changing that story? And without a doubt that comes from media. And so you'll, you've seen this big wave of us going into media and it's been really fascinating. Um, and so Culture House arose out of me meeting with, um, me getting set up on a friend date by a friend at Refinery29. I was working on a project with them and, and they were, and, and my friend Sam goes, have you met this? Do you know Raysham? Do you know Ray Nijan? And I was like, no, I don't. She's like, okay, I'm gonna send you guys up on a friend date. So Ray and I meet and fall in love and spent mm -hmm. hours together talking and then started like brainstorming an idea. And then basically a year later had a company together. And uh, so we started a company with our other partner, Nicole. So we, the three of us have um, a premium documentary um, film and TV company. We're one of the only women of color. Ray is um, Indian woman one of the only majority women of color owned um, and up run production companies in the premium doc space. Um, and so it's been really fascinating. And, and we are laser focused on that intersection of pop culture and politics about how do particularly women, particularly people of color, how do their lives unfold at that intersection? Mm -hmm. um, and so we have projects that are, some of these aren't announced, so I'm gonna be a little bit cagey, but about um, accessing black women's, uh, accessing beauty through the lens of black women's hair. Um, um, that will be out sometime next year with some very exciting big, big names that everyone in the world has heard of. Um, mm -hmm. A show for Netflix about racism and misogyny um, that will also be out sometime next year. So much of this stuff was supposed to come out this year, but because of COVID, um, 
the dates have been pushed back nearly a year for a lot of the stuff. And then a show about progressive adolescence, like how do we how do we start teaching ourselves better stories about what teenage years look like that will be on Disney Plus. Um, also with some pretty exciting names attached. So really trying to think, have substantive deep conversations about stuff that matters, um, but in a approachable, fun, accessible way. Right, and I love that it's basically you know, education and empowerment and entertainment all in one. Um, and I'm so excited that you get to really contribute your lens to storytelling after everything that you've already accomplished and all of the things that you've seen in the world and applying that so that future generations can really thrive from the stories that you're telling. So thank you, Carrie, for being a guest on Absolutely. this special broadcast of Grit and Glamour. Um, so thank you all if you are tuning in uh, thank you for watching another episode of Grit and Glamour. I hope you, we see you next time, but also please vote. Okay. That's my last word. That's it. Please go out there, vote, submit your ballot, get your mama on board, get your friend on board, call somebody. And from me and Carrie, here's to all the grit behind the glamour. Thank you. Bye.